This program is made possible by funding from Humanities Guahan, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Federal CARES Act. Stina Guian, Mampus Donkulu, Na Akonu e Islan Guahan. Ikina no nya, Mampus Megge, Na Akonu Esta e Entalu e Isla, Za Asota e Tauto, Man Mo Nyo, Parailina La Nia, Janima Maila na Tempu. Ito Tomo na, Matungu, Na Debi no Guaha Humato Gui. Lo imam pescador toda suetin nia. Esta ki hun dia. Guaha man medgut na man hoben sita na famalawan. Gi isla ma usa i fetsa nia jan itiningu nia para um fan macho chu todu sia ta uma koni esti i dankuluna guihan. Pogu guaha mas piligru gi itasi jan itano. Mas donkulu gi idankulu na guiha. Mas donkulu gi isla. Afa isti na piligru i basula. My name is Cami. My name is Francesca. This is From Our Nanas For Our Nennies. The show where we take a good look at big issues. And use the wisdom of our elders. To find solutions for future generations. Now we're back to weave a story powerful enough. To help capture one of the big fishes of our time. The, the waste, waste crisis. crisis. Well, the plastic crisis is definitely one of the top environmental issues that we're facing in society today. But waste affects a lot of other things. It's not just plastic waste, it's other waste. This is an urgent issue. This is a crisis situation. We have a lot of trash on Guam. We import everything and most of it's non-biodegradable and a lot of it's single-use items. <laughs> and so we just kind of bring things in, throw them away, bring in some more. When it gets old and broken, throw it away. <laughs> So you can't do that forever. Perhaps the vast majority of people don't understand the extent to which we can recycle on Guam. I mean, worldwide, the, the world is challenged with, with plastics. Plastic was introduced as a useful product. It was cheap, easy to create, and quickly became a ubiquitous material in our region. When we look at plastic and how we use it in society, especially on, in our island. It's helped make life easier, more convenient. We're able to afford things more because plastic is so cheap and people are able to have fiestas and have you know these uh, really convenient disposable plates and utensils. For the moment, right, it makes for a great experience. It's part, you know, our culture really is surrounded by family and, get, and gathering and eating together. So culturally, it, it's helped to um, bring our families together in a way, but when we look at the big picture and what happens to this plastic waste after we're done with it, we cannot recycle styrofoam plates, we cannot recycle plastic utensils, you know, unless someone's going out there and collecting it and, you know, washing them and reusing them, but that's very unlikely. If you think about it, everyone in the Pacific, right, traditionally, everything we used was biodegradable. We didn't have plastic, we didn't have any trash. So where did people throw things away before? If you have a woven basket, you just throw it in the side. Everything that was used was biodegradable, right? There's no plastic wrapping for your food. So I think um, for indigenous communities throughout the Pacific, this is a new thing, is adapting to figuring out, wait a minute, there's certain things that don't biodegrade when we throw it off to the side. In fact, this aluminum can is gonna last forever, or this plastic bottle is gonna last forever. And in addition to that, all of those items are also new items that are being shipped into Guam. None of them are even made here. 
So you're actually bringing in new stuff and then just throwing it you know, around. They're not even made from the island. Whereas most of the products that would be used in any indigenous society in the Pacific just came from whatever they had. It came from wood, it came from shells, uh, whatever you had. And then those things were put to use to make different items that they needed and then eventually discarded and thrown somewhere off to the side and didn't really create a lot of trash. They were natural items anyway. And how did it get here? This throwaway culture is definitely something that was brought here by Westerners, and we all know this. This is a big part of Westernization. This is a big part of uh, sort of the corporate structure of the world. It's a big part of the worldwide culture right now, and it's something that uh, I think the world actually has to start addressing because we're going to run out of room for all our trash and our plastics. Plastic was first invented in 1907, but it began being used heavily after World War II. Before there was plastic, there was ivory, and they extracted ivory from elephants, right? So ivory was being used to make combs and most popularly billiard balls. Then society kind of reached a crisis point where they had almost killed off all of the elephants. So this billiard producer posted an ad in the paper and said that if anybody can find an alternative to ivory, then he would give them a $10,000 reward in gold. So then a man named John Wesley Hyatt formed the first version of celluloid, which is actually still used today. Where plastic really took off was during the war. Uh, plastic production quadrupled during World War II. So what I think is most interesting about the history of plastic is that it was invented because they had almost killed off all of the elephants, right? They were extracting so much ivory from these elephants that they were like, oh my gosh, we need to find a solution. And then they created plastic thinking it was the most amazing thing. And now we are literally drowning and suffocating in it and can't get rid of it. Leading to today, where in 2019, 368 million metric tons was produced worldwide. 50% of that plastic is single use plastic. If we follow the current of our waste stream through our islands, where does it come from and where does it go? We decided to take a look at our own trash and recycling. <gasps> this is what a few weeks of our trash looks like. Let's break it down and see what's inside. A lot of mailers. Hit bag, mail, drink box, more mail, uh, coconut water, this sun is kitchen trash, more plastic food packaging, thing of, what are these, sanitary wipes, another Celsius. This is just the beginning and I'm hoping that everything that I learn will help me kind of pare down what I have at home and be a little bit better with all the trash that I create. Hafade Todu Hemzu, Guahu C. Jasmine, creator of New Matlow, a new zero waste refillery on wheels. And I'm back today to bring you more tips, tricks, and insight on how to begin your low waste journey. Today we're on to the second of the five big R's of zero waste living. Number two, reduce. Reducing means being a conscious consumer and only buying the things that you need and not that you want. If you do need to make a purchase, invest in higher quality items. Although they tend to be more expensive, they're more durable and will last time. So find one that falls within your budget. Here are some examples of everyday items you can reduce. Reduce all the plastic wrap in your house and buy some reusable beeswax wraps instead. You can replace paper towels with reusable rags, kitchen sponges with biodegradable wooden ones, and bottled shampoo and conditioner with bars 
They work exactly the same without the packaging. My pro tip is to start small. It can be really overwhelming once you see just how much plastic lives in your home. But please don't throw the plastic products away. Be resourceful and use them first. It'll take time to build the sustainable alternatives in your home. So be smart. If you like these tips and tricks and want to invest in our island, please consider donating to our Kickstarter launching next month in May. This has been Jasmine with Numatlo signing off, wishing you the best on your low waste journey. And don't forget that every small individual effort does build our collective resiliency against this plastic pandemic. It's kind of sad how out of all of this trash, only that much of it gets recycled. When people say they're just gonna throw something away, they don't think about where away is. They don't stop and think about the fact that away is still on Guam, still on this earth. It doesn't just, you know, disappear. These green and black bins we see around the island are collected by the Guam Solid Waste Authority and their fleet of sanitation workers. We spoke to Roman Perez and Andrew Gale at GSWA to learn more about where our trash and recycling goes. I, I oversee uh, uh, daily collection and our daily collection is from Monday to Thursday. We pick up residential trash. Uh, I also handle the three uh, transfer stations, which is uh, Harmon Transfer Station, Malolo Transfer Station, and the Agate Transfer Stations. That's where uh, the customers that are not being serviced by us, they come in and they drop off their trash or the recycles. So right now, Guam Solo Waste Authority has about 19,000, 20,000 customers, residential customers. But we estimate that there are close to 38,000 or 40,000 eligible residential households that should have residential trash service. So we think we only have about half of the residents of the island as customers. Because the most majority of our routes, they, they dump twice. So when their truck is full, they bring it to Mr. Rubbishman. Uh, and, and get weight and dump on a tipping floor. Mr. Rubbishman, also known as Guahan Waste Control, is the company responsible for sorting residential and commercial trash for the island and collecting and sorting residential recycling from both GSWA pickup and transfer stations. We spoke to Bob Perrin, president of Guahan Waste Control. Our company probably does, if you count the military, about 65% of the island solid waste that we haul and, and process. And then at our transfer station out here in our front, we um, have about 90 to 95% of all the island's trash comes through here. And then we have it uh, dumped on the tipping floor. We go through it looking for banned materials, that, things that aren't supposed to go into the landfill, like green waste, cardboard, metal waste, e-waste, things of that nature have to be pulled out before we push it over into a transfer trailer and then haul it down to the Lee John landfill. So it's, it's kind of affected the economics, the fact that it can no longer go to China. But what happens to the plastic? It's not a real lucrative business, recycling, because it's the value of the commodities that you, you process it into. The cost to do that is fairly high and the value coming out the other end is fairly low. And then when you add shipping costs on top of it, it becomes very difficult to make ends meet. And so it's not something you would choose to go into to get rich, that's, that's for sure. It's as much a, a passion for our company to do it and for the people that work here to, to do that sort of thing. And right now, plastics, I don't know if there's a home for it. I don't think there's a home for it anywhere. With all of these things that, as a society, we're consuming, we don't always know where it ends up, right? I mean, even if we, people have the best intentions to recycle their plastic waste, especially today with COVID, um, recycling plastic is really not a viable solution. Um, especially for Guam, we don't have um, anywhere to send our plastic waste. So a lot of, all of it just actually stays here on island. It goes to our landfill um, if it's properly disposed of. Only a small portion of our waste ends up being recycled currently. 
and the most recent data from 2017 concluded that only 32% of our trash was recycled at all. That leaves a majority to be sent to Ladsland Landfill in Malolo. We visited Norm Kivett, the current manager of the landfill, to learn more about it and see it for ourselves. A landfill is an engineered facility designed to take waste, where a dump is just throw it in a canyon. The average over the last, I believe, nine and a half years is fairly close to 300 tons. The landfill is designed with 11 cells. Um, they built the first two, two cells in 2011. Um, so the overall to fill the 11 cells is an unknown. Um, it's taken us, we've been in cell one and cell two. They built those two together for nine and a half years, or close to that. The total area of the Ladsen Landfill is 126 acres, and the rate at which we are filling it up comes at a significant cost. The Fifth Guam Legislature had to float a bond. Um, we had to borrow the $30 million to be able to pay for it. And so oh, wow. in my mind, I'm like, I'm borrowing against my kids at this point. My kids aren't going to be able to fund, um, you know, nurses and teachers in their in the future schools because we're busy paying off this trash bill that we've created for ourselves. So yeah, it's really, it's an issue, wow. it's a huge challenge. But there are ways that we can mitigate the cost of this system and make it more efficient and accessible to a majority of residents. One of the things that the, the receiver put in place many years ago was a curbside recycling program. Now, the curbside recycling program allowed a customer of Guam Solid Waste Authority who already had the trash cart, you know those trash carts, those brown trash carts with the black lids? If you already had one of those and you're on one of our routes, we'll give you, free of charge, we won't charge you anything else other than what you're paying, this identical trash cart except it has a green lid. So the issue that we have right now is, is we collect all these plastics, no one will take them. So they're they're kind of stockpiling up in these in our in these in our re recycling handler and Mr. Rubbishman happens to be a recycling handler, and I think eventually we just put them in put them in the landfill anyways. Without universal trash pickup, how can we address and prevent illegal dumping? How does trash and plastic specifically affect our environment and our lives in turn? To answer that question, we have to step outside of the waste stream and into our jungles and our waters in the next episode.